ಓಂಜನಂ ನಿತ್ಯಮನಂತರೂಪಂ ಭಕ್ತಾನುಕಂಪಾಧೃತವಿಗ್ರಹಂ ವೈ ಈಶಾವತಾರಂ ಪರಮೇಶಮಿಡ್ಯಂ ಸಮರಾಮಕೃಷ್ಣ ಶಿರಸ ನಮ ನಮಸ್ತೆ ಎವ್ರಿ ಒನ್ ಎನ್ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಟು ಅವರ್ ಸ್ಟಡಿ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಭಗವದ್ಗೀತಾ ಚಾಪ್ಟರ್ ಥರ್ಟೀನ್ ಕ್ಷೇತ್ರ ಕ್ಷೇತ್ರಜ್ಞ ವಿಭಾಗ ಯೋಗ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಗೋಯಿಂಗ್ ಥ್ರೂ the final revision of this chapter trying to understand how we can apply these teachings in our everyday life um, live a life that is enlightened in the knowledge of vedanta and also practice uh, our spiritual disciplines in a proper way with the proper understanding of who we are as a spiritual beings what is this entity god which you call god what is our relationship with him or it or her and what is the purpose or what are the means by which we can get reunited with our higher self i mean so in the chapter 13 shri krishna in the beginning talks about the field kshetra which is this whatever is in this creation manifestation prakriti nature which is ego body mind emotions physical body and the external world and then he talks about <clears throat> what is called knowledge those are the disciplines that are practiced to be practiced uh, which facilitate the purification of the mind if it which facilitates the reorientation of the mind here it means uh, redirecting it or withdrawing it from the external world the sense bound world and inverting it directing it inwards uh, through our buddhi to the reality that is behind the ego which shines through this body through the mind but it is so subtle that the senses cannot perceive it that the mind cannot think about it yet it is the foundation on which everything exists that supreme being is the subject matter of the third section of the gita uh, of chapter 13 which is the known and we were looking at those verses and trying to visualize or understand how we can relate to them so chapter verse 13 talked about ge that is to be known we've gone through this and it is not something far away no god that we will meet when we die or something it is here and now interpenetrating and the word is it is imminent in everything so there are two types of ideas one is the transcendental reality beyond name and form beyond time space and causation beyond nature beyond the three gunas triguna tita beyond prakriti we on the reach of mind and speech avang manocha gocharam but that same reality is in the process of this creation manifestation preservation and withdrawal and that is called shakti brahman and shakti are two aspects of the same reality we all as individuals are in this realm and as such we are in the jurisdiction of the power shakti para shakti whom we address as the divine mother she is the mistress of the whole universe the empress of the whole universe by her will everything happens she is the supreme controller ishwara or ishwari whether you want to address that in personal of being as as the masculine or feminine but it is a power uh, which is responsible for the projection and for the all the changes that happen during the process of preservation and the final withdrawal of the forms into that formless reality how do we know it is there how do we get a sense of it where do we seek for it it's right in front of us we should not seek for it we should see it so that's why swami vivekananda said don't seek for god see him he's right in front of you in all these so many forms within us we can discern its presence we can infer its presence by the functioning of the 
Indriyas, the organs, gross organs, Jnana Indriyas and Karma Indriyas. So verse 13 talked about that novel which has hands and feet everywhere, eyes, head and mouths everywhere, ears everywhere, exists in creatures by pervading them all. Sarvam avritya tishthati. And it's about developing an awareness with the help of this knowledge, a constant awareness of the presence of the power as our bodies, our physical activities go on, as our senses function, as our minds think. We realize that none of this happens if that consciousness is not within us. To acknowledge its presence and give the right, you might say, agency, the doership, to this entity or this power behind the ego. Ignorance is when the ego appropriates to itself the doership. Kartaham, bhoktaham, and I'm the enjoyer. Why? Because in its limited uh, understanding, it thinks it's an independent entity. Uh, it says I'm a wave, but there's no ocean behind me type of thing. While with this knowledge says, no, no, this, the reality is the ocean which manifests itself in so many waves. We are a name and a form. We have appeared. That means the ego appeared. And the mind appeared with this all emotions, thoughts and ideas. Then it materialized itself as a physical body. But these are transient. They come and they go. Yet, But the ultimate reality remains. So I think that's pretty clear. And then we try to become aware of its presence through the functions of the senses, sarve indriya guna bhasam. But we also should be, uh, just like if the light and the various tube lights and light bulbs are shining, then we say there is a manifestation of light, but it is possible because the electricity is there. If one of the bulbs fuses, all the bulbs fuse, that doesn't mean the electricity is not there. It means, so, Sarve Indriya Vivarjitam. If no bulbs are there, still that light is there. That is transcendent to this senses. Asaktam Sarva Bhrishcheva Nirganam Gunabhokpricha. Unattached and verily the support of all. So, the ocean supports all the waves. Without the gunas, beyond the prakriti. And it is yet the perceiver of the gunas. So, when I see the eye sees, actually, it, the Atman or the self is the seer, the eye of the eye. That's how the scriptures describe the ear of the ear. And that means the real power behind the eyes that sees. It's not the eyes are the physical instrument only. But if you don't pay attention to something, then you don't register, you don't see them. So that attention, that consciousness that comes from deep within is actually the necessary component for the perception to happen. So basically, from this verse, we said there is something that's very subtle within us, which activates everything, yet it can exist independent of this form. Where does it exist? It exists inside and outside. So we bring the example of the bubble, a soap bubble. A soap bubble forms and creates a boundary. There's air inside, there's air outside. But the space is not divided by the boundary of the soap bubble. It is inside and outside. It seems to be apparently divided, yet it is not divided. The other example that's given is if you take a gagri or a mud pot or pot and you submerge it in water, then the water fills inside. There's water outside, there's water inside. But the boundary of that pot is the ego that says, this is me and the rest is outside. This is aham. The rest is this idam. And that boundary then defines the personality, the individuality. And that is the cause of this embodiment. Bahir antascha bhutanam. So it's bahir means outside, antar means inside. Bhutana means, you know, all beings. Asharam charamevacha. It is moving and it's not moving also. The next part of this sutra is important. Sukshma, sukshmatvat avignyayo. Why don't we comprehend it? Why is it incomprehensible? Avignam sukshmatvat due to its intrinsic subtleness. And we said that as, as a solid thing like ice, we can hold it, we can touch it. As water, we can still um, put it in the cup of our hand or in a vessel. But when it becomes very subtle, like water vapor, 
then it's out there. We know it's in this water vapor in, uh, in the room, but it has become so subtle that our eyes are not able to discern it, not able to perceive it. Now, using this example, this reality is even finer than that. So subtlety means it's uh, fineness and to, to comprehend that we have to develop that capacity to discern those fine fine dimensions, the subtle dimensions of reality. And yoga is really developing that, that capacity, mental capacity, where the mind is become so purified in that it is able to discern those subtle entities that are there, but not comprehensible or graspable by our subtle uh, the senses or the mind. Sukshmatvat avignyayam. Durastham cha antike chata is very far away to a person of ignorance. And antike is right in my own heart uh, for a realized soul. So basically, through these three verses, we have talked about some entity there. That is the foundation of this universe, foundation of me, and is the power which activates the body and the mind and the senses yet it exists independent of that. That means if all the waves subsided, the ocean still exists. If all the ice melted and the water evaporated, the water vapor state still exists, just as an analogy. So, I think we had, this was a bit of revision. Avibhaktam cha bhuteshu vivaktam iva cha It means it is undivided, though it appears to be existing as divided in all beings. So how many Paramatman is there? How many oceans are there? It's only ocean, one ocean. How many Jivatmans are there? As many as the waves. So this limited being is called the Jivatman. And that is because it has got its own boundary and definition. A bubble has got its own parameter, so to say. A wave has got its own form that has appeared. The ocean itself is formless, but the waves have appeared as form. So, avibhaktam means really it is indivisible, but vibhaktam iva. Iva means it appears to be really. So, if you uh, blow this, so bubbles out there, each bubble comp contains within itself so much space, but after some time they all bust up. And while those bubbles were there, we said that's the space comp contained by the bubble X, Y, and Z. Likewise, this universal consciousness, the I consciousness of the Supreme, becomes reflected in little pots of water, and you see a reflected sun. That reflected sun is the ego of the individual, the water is the mind and the intellect, and the pot is the body. That's an analogy given. There's only one sun in the sky, you can put one pot out there and see one reflected sun, or you can put a million pots and you see a million suns. That doesn't in any way affect the sun in the sky. And if suppose all the pots were broken, that again does not say that the sun in the sky does not exist. So likewise, the Supreme Consciousness Brahman is independent, but on it, out of it, everything exists. And we are this pot of water with the reflected sun. That is the jiva, so to say, in that analogy. Avihaktam cha bhuteshu, vivaktam cha vivaktam iva cha istitam bhuta bharti tatagnyayam grasishnu prabhi vishnu cha tagnyayam. Know that to be, to be the sustainer of all beings as well as the devourer and the originator. So this supreme being, what's our relationship to be? It, out of it, we all have come. Out of the ocean, all the waves have come. The ocean sustains all the waves. Out of it, it has come. So it's the originator. And into it, all the waves will submerge. It is the devourer. When we break this into three functional forms, then we say creation, preservation, and withdrawal. And sometimes we personify that. Then we say creator is Brahma. The preserver function is Vishnu. And Rudra is the, that functional form. Uh, aspect of the supreme when he is resolving all those forms into itself 
destroying destroy is not the right word it is resolving into its course the ice melts into water type of thing the universe resolves into consciousness ultimately i hope we're all good up to there now jyoti shamapita jyoti tamasa param ucchate gyanam gyam gyana gamyam hridi sarvasya vishtitam okay so jyoti sham apita jyoti it is the light even of lights and here we are not talking about the light of a candle or the sun it is the light of intelligence that we feel inside us okay that's the jyoti but there is a source of that intelligence also jyoti sham apita jyoti it's the light even of light so when we feel we are an intelligent being a conscious being uh, we activate this body, this sense of I that is there. It's a self sort of feels it to be a self-conscious entity. Really, it is that reflected sun in the pot of water that thinks I am the real sun. It's only a reflection. The real light is this light. The real source of that light is not the reflected sun, but the sun in the sky. That sun of the sky is that supreme being, Paramatman or Brahman. Jyoti Sham Apitat Jyoti Tamasa Param Uchate. Uchate means it has been said or it is said to be Tamasa Param. Param means beyond. Tamasa means beyond ignorance or darkness. It is spoken of as beyond darkness. Darkness of ignorance. What is ignorance? that sense of I and mine. So when that pro proper knowledge comes, then it doesn't say I'm the reflected sun identified with this body-mind complex. Then it says, I'm the real sun in the sky. And Nirvana Shatakam of Acharya Shankara basically says, you know, Mano buddhi ahamkara chittani naham. I'm not the mind, not the buddhi, not the ego, not the chitta. Negates all these things to which the mind is attached to, and then it affirms, Chidananda Rupo, Shivoham, Shivoham. My true nature is, I am the sun in the sky. I am that universal being. I am really the ocean. That is my true identity. With that knowledge, I can still function. This wave appears out of that ocean. It disappears into that ocean. But the ocean does, is not born. The ocean does not die. When we identify with ourselves with the wave, then we suffer under the illusion that we are born and we are dying and that fear of death and all those type of things come. So it is in ignorance that we suffer. An ultimate solution is to bring in the light of spiritual knowledge. Uh, uh, otherwise, we're just passing the problem from this side to that side. Jnanam geyam jnani gamyam. So what is it? It is knowledge, the noble and the known. All these That's three it. things. Jnanam, Gyanam, Jnanam, Gamyam. Where do you search for it? It exists in the heart of all beings. Especially, it exists especially in the heart of all beings. Of course, it doesn't mean the physical heart. It doesn't mean anything in the physical body. Uh, it means the core of one's being. That means the sense of I-ness. Beyond this I-ness. Uh, when you say from the bottom of my heart, that means it's beyond the reality, the center of our being. Hrit, I am. Hridayam. Hrit means the center. I am means this. So when you say Hridayam, that's the feeling that this is the core of being. And when we talk about, we, when we identify ourselves as, as a mental, emotional, physical being, then we just point to the center of our heart. As I feel it from the bottom of my heart. But really, when you add that spiritual dimension, then we say that center really is at the spiritual dimension. And true well-being, spiritual well-being, uh, or the means to true well-being is being established in that center. That's the question that is asked when somebody asks you, Aapka swastha kaisa hai? Swastha are you established on your true self? Swamiji, what is meant by Chitanand, uh, the Rupam Shuvam Shuvam that you said? Chid Anand. Chid means consciousness. Anand means bliss. Okay. So Chid Anand, Chid Anand, Rupam, that is my true nature. 
Shivoham, Shivoham. I'm Shiva, I'm Shiva. Shiva here doesn't mean Lord Shiva and that, that we see sitting in Mount Kailash. It means that which is the nature of auspiciousness, consciousness. So basically, it is saying, uh, if you read the Nirvana Shatakam, and I think, I'm not sure whether I have uploaded it on our website or not, but it's available on the internet. Uh, beautiful uh, eight st stanzas composed by Acharya Shankara. Each of those stanzas ends with Chidananda Rupo Shivoham Shivoham. So we keep on reminding us ourselves, telling us the truth of who we are and not repeating the falsehood of what we are not. So every time we say I am and we say I am this body mind, this is, we put one more layer, one more samskara has been created and that hides that light of knowledge. So we bring in that reverse that process, constantly reminding ourselves that we are a spiritual being of the nature of infinite existence, not knowledge, please. Akhanda Satchidananda, Nitya Shuddha, Buddha Mukta. That's how the scriptures tell. Nitya means I'm eternal, beyond time. Shuddha, I'm infinitely pure. Any um, sin or any bad act cannot pollute the mind. It might appear to pollute the mind, but really it will not. Just like the example that is given in a room, if you light a fire and there's so much smoke, the whole space seems to be smoky. But you open the window and the, the smoke flies out and it's just so clean as before. The air got polluted, but not the space. So in that way, the Atman is untouchable, cannot be touched, cannot be polluted. And we try to remember that idea Niranjana, that is the meaning of the word, taintless. Nitya, Shuddha, Buddha, Buddha means his consciousness. Mukta means ever free. In ignorance, it has become identified with this body-mind complex. And that's why it is thinking, it is bound. But really, it is ever free. And that uh, suffering that comes is because of that ignorance. How do we go beyond this ignorance? We bring in this light of knowledge. Once reading this verse, one listening will not do because so much of the opposite ideas have been there all the time from childhood and many lifetimes. So we repeatedly through practice, abhyasa and sadhana, japa and meditation generate this new site of, set of spiritual samskaras based on the true nature of our higher self. And as that builds up with that, with the help of that, uh, spiritual samskaras, uh, there's a proper orientation of the mind in proper identification of who we are. So that's the sadhana part of it. Jnanam, genyam, jnanagamnyam, hridi sarvasya vishthitam. So when we say uh, we are supposed to meditate in our heart, definitely it is not the physical heart. It is not the mental sense of, sense of the being. It is a spiritual heart. That pure consciousness out of on which this whole body-mind complex has been superimposed. That is the one that we are trying to approach. But then we said, hey, it is beyond mind, it's beyond speech. How can you contemplate and meditate on something which is beyond mind and speech, beyond the senses? And that is why in the process to guide us, to help us in that process, we use some form as a representation of that Supreme Being. It's a form of light or some divine form or some special manifestation of that divine form in, that came into this world as an incarnation, avatara, who is the embodiment of all those wonderful divine qualities. And that gives the mind a support because constantly the mind is able to hold on to that. The mind requires some tangible form. Without that, it's not able to form a concept, an image in the mind space. So we use that and but ultimately we can transcend that also uh, that's how the the psychology psychological principle is applied there in our spiritual sadhana so after explaining up to these verses up to 13.17 sri krishna says iti shetram tatha jnanam geyam choktam samasata briefly samasata in brief i have explained or uh, spoken of what? Shetram, right in the beginning, 
Tatha means end. Jnanam means the second part of it, the knowledge. Gayam is what was just described. This has been ex explained and described very briefly. So what's the point of all this? Well, if a person who is devoted to me knows this, knows this here doesn't mean an intellectual, philosophical type of understanding. Definitely not. It is nothing to do with intellectual grasp of it. It is really an experience of it. So, mad bhakta etad vignaya, uh, realization. We experience it directly. What happens? Mad bhavaya bhava upapadhyate. That person becomes qualified upapadhyate for mad bhavaya, for my state. What is that state? That high state of the supreme being that we've just talked about, the ocean behind the waves. So the wave that is now directing its attention inwards and says, what is there below me? Where did I come from? What is supporting me at every minute? Where will I go when this form disappears? What is nature? And becomes introverted, sort of directs the mind inwards. What will happen? That wave will subside and become one with the ocean. And when the form drops up, uh, or the attachment to the form drops up, then one becomes identified with that other entity, which is that infinite ocean. And that is something out of the world, so to say, compared to the experience of the wave. So deep, so vast, so profound. And that is called Brahma Jnana. Brahman means that which is vast, limit, limitless. So it's an actual experience, it's not some understanding in the mind that uh, by a lot of intellectual sharpening of the mind and discourse or studying a particular text again and again and again, one creates the conception and say, ah, I got it. All you get it is some idea in your mind, a representation of it in the mind. And that is not knowledge in the spiritual way. That is knowledge in our everyday way of life. It is chitta vritti. This is beyond chitta vritti, a state where there are no vrittis. Mind is waveless. That is how it is explained in the spiritual sciences. Can I okay. Can I ask the question, Swamji? Yeah. Um, when you when you talk about knowledge and knowing, can we know the knower? So can we know the subject, or it is just it is about realizing the knower, uh, the re realizing the subject. It is realizing the subject. It is not knowing the subject. Okay. We have talked that explained very much in detail in the Kashmir Shaivism. So when we say something is the knowledge, knowledge is when the knower, which is the light of consciousness from within, interacts with some another source of energy that comes from outside through the senses. In the mind space it meets, and the combination creates a vritti, an image. That image is represented. That's called vritti jnana. And it's got a form, and you give a definition to it or label to it, and you say, this is a bird, this is a cow, this is a person. And we say, I know that person so much. All you know is this representations of, uh, of what is outside there in your mind space. That is what is what you call knowledge. But can the Nava be made known? So Nava is the subject. If it is made known, then it's no longer Nava. It has become an object. Yes. yes. So when we say Brahma Jnana, then what it, does that mean? That means Jnana means it doesn't mean it's not. That's why I'm saying the word is. See, we are trying to realize something which will not be realized by the mind. Can you understand? Every understanding yes. is not the reality. It's a representation of the reality in our mind space. All right? So, Brahman is the Nava. If you, it's a subject. If you make that an objective knowledge, then it's no longer the subject. So, the example that is given on a sunny day, you're st out, uh, standing out there and you look at your uh, shadow at your feet. And then you try to catch that shadow with your feet, your head with your feet. So you do a somersault. What happens? The head is not there at that place anymore. You see? So that's the example given that 
you cannot know Brahman or your own self through Vritti Jnana. Not through the senses, not through the mind. And the scriptures are very clear. Avang Manocha Gocharam. Not with this sense mind, not, uh, not the senses, not with this mind. How is it known? This same mind is to be purified through sadhana. So Sri Ramakrishna says, Shuddha Man, Shuddha Buddhi, Shuddha Atma Ek. That means the mind that is directed outwards, when it's directed out, it's creating so many ripples in the mind space. You direct it inwards. And the ripples become less because now outside signals are not going there. There's a difference between the Nava and the mind at that time, in between. We know from uh, Sutra uh, 3 of Kashmir Shaivism, okay, to bring that knowledge also. That's why we studied that particular uh, text there. What is it? Um, the Nana. Uh, that's, uh, I think the verse uh, Sutra uh, Grahiya Grahaka Bhedat Tadnana Anurupa Grahiya Grahaka Bhedat This world appears to be manifold Nanar Anurup It appears as a form How? Grahiya means the Nava Grahaka is the known Bhedat Difference so what we actually know is the difference between me and the object, not the object itself. That's what's creating the difference. Like two planes are flying at the same speed in the space, then you don't see any difference in speed. But when one is fast and slower, then you see one is moving forward or backward relative to each other. So likewise, when this mind is different from the consciousness, the difference produces a vritti in the mind. And we think that's how we know. When this mind rises to the higher level and it's the same plane, then the difference becomes zero and therefore there is no vritti. But it is, it is at that time in perfect resonance with the reality. So it is an experience, but it is not a type of knowledge of a vritti. You are one with that reality at that time. That's called anubhuti. It's a more powerful way of experiencing but it's not like a knowledge in your mind space. Okay. Swamiji, Swamiji mm. it's, it's, <clears throat> it's probably like, um, I don't know where I read it, but it's, uh, there's no mind involved at all, right? No vritti in the mind. Ha, so the mind is not involved at all. It's silent. Yeah, no vritti. No waves. Yeah. So that's the definition in Patanji Yoga Sutta. Yoga Chitta Vritti Nirodha. Perfect concentration is when there is total cessation of all waves in the mind space. But it's not concentration, is it? It's like it's silent. Yeah. Here it means you use the word concentration. It's not con concentration means you're totally focused on that one object. Yeah. Okay. Oh. It is about being one with it. Sama dhi. Sama means same. Dhi means buddhi. It is your, it, the concept in, in physics is res, you're one with it, resonating with it. Mm -hmm. Just like, uh, uh, how do I say? Just like yes, your, resonance. Eh? Yeah, resonance. Yeah, resonance. Is, if you understand that idea, then you're one with it. And since you know yourself, okay, all the time, and that's what you are outside there. So they say, for example, a drop of water drops in the ocean and becomes one with it. That means no difference is there. But now that drop of water feels it oneness with the whole ocean. So it's an experience. The drop of water, which was defined by its own little boundary, thought itself to be a little thing. When it falls in the ocean, its boundary disappears. But what, what happens? It becomes identified with that totality. That so is an experience. You, yeah, so the experience usually happens through the heart. So could you say then it would be a feeling? It's an experience. It's, it's a feeling. It's more of a feeling than an intellectual understanding, definitely. You will yeah. feel it, okay? Feel it. And therefore, yeah, the heart is the, the gateway to realization, not the intellect. 
at yeah, some point we have to abandon the intellect on the outskirts out, outside the and entire within i also had the kind of same question is it like we feel love we feel the feelings that we feel we can we cannot know that we can yes. just of course you are knowing it but like so so uh, the the feeling of love between a mother and the child okay now the child can't talk about it can't explain it doesn't have the words to it does it mean it does not feel of course very powerfully agree mm. Mm. yeah mm. like that yes. so you so it, at some point you have to understand that we yes we understand the intellectual all this philosophy but we should not try to you know uh, uh, we should not labor under the illusion that through rationalizing concentration reasoning intellectual gymnastics all those things i will grasp the truth you get uh, some 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 shadow of it okay actually yes. ev every thought activity hides the reality i'll give you another example suppose you go to the movie cinema and you, before the movie starts you know get the light projector lights up the whole screen lights up what do you see you see only light but suddenly some images begin to appear and you begin to see each of them the characters appear in the movie drives when we are focusing on the shadows actually those images are shadows we have forgotten about the light so actually all the characters shadows which is so interesting is all this vrittis in our mind and our attention is focused on those shadows not on the light when all the shadows disappear then suddenly we say oh that's light but you see if any if a drop is there a dot is there then we say there's a dot i'm not saying there's a whole screen so much light in a little bit of dot we just say there's a dot there so we have to change um, uh, this vritti means the shadows that is the light that has been obstructed that is what we are think in confusing it to be knowledge yeah but it's so funny isn't it it's so ironic that the mind and the senses which are two gateways to 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 living are uh, are the two gateways to being the obstruction from getting to the heart yes the mind is the prison the prisoner okay and we think he is our person who is going to release us okay anyway so hello samiji samiji yeah. yeah. <laughs> um you know you said the the movie screen you were talking about the movie the, the movie screen the screen yeah. of the movie when you are watching the yeah. the characters the characters also are mm. not real they they are just acting a part when they come away from the movie all the actors and all that they are ordinary people and um, the screen depicts them as uh, real people like right? we have a story we watching it on the screen but when we go away the characters are not they are at all we are only looking at images exactly the characters are living their own living their own lives in some other way what they has what we have seen on the screen is so much different from the real life yes so, the, the magician who creates this magic okay mm -hmm. think about the magician the the art the and the technique and the tools the director, and the control the and the director and he has become the director he has become the actor he is creating all the things and then we are just so fascinated with the movie that we forgot to make any friendship with the the, the movie maker and that or the real person you see so at some point when we the mind says hey i'm not interested in the movies okay there could be tragedies there could be comedies there could be murder on the screen for a while the screen looks red because some blood was there but when the projector switched off the screen is still has retained its own innate purity so this world is like that mm -hmm. but it's a little bit convoluted isn't it well these are so many so this is why they say it's why is the divine creating these things you know is all full of bliss why does he want to create all this misery and all these characters and and all those things you might ask uh, in some famous movie actor you know why do you act all those things you know why do you have the role of a hero and a villain and this and that <laughs> he said i'm i love acting you know i enjoy this you know i get money I get money or this and that i this is i'm doing out of fun 
you know but he says i'm just acting it doesn't mean that i become a real criminal or bega in a movie i'm exactly. acting i'm aware of it in our case the actor has forgotten and that is what is called spiritual ignorance but and that's why the move acting is so good then okay then why is the focus not just so why do we give so much um importance to the mind because so that's the gateway now when the mind is directed outwards yeah yeah, yeah. then yeah. so so a person that has you know doesn't have a mind have has lost their mind you hear so many cases where people don't have memory terrible <laughs> um so yeah so it has a function yet we need to silence it so it says the scriptures maneva manushya nam karanam bandha mokshayo mind alone is the cause of both karanam both mm. bandha and moksha okay so it's mm. very important how we use mm. it when it's directed towards the external world taking the shadows to be real taking the objective world to be you know source of all enjoyment then it becomes a the news by which we hang ourselves so to say you know but when that same mind becomes gracious turns around and says no i want to turn around and face the light that is the real thing that is creating this movie i want to discover the source of that that is the introverted mind that is the mind the spiritual seeker jigyasu and that is the path of nivritti sadhana and all that it begins to lose interest in the shadows the, the light itself is so beautiful and and that mind is rightly oriented so okay to take that thinking further gyana you know how they talk about the four pathways then the only pathway available is bhakti because that's the only one that's going to connect that's the only one that's going to make you feel yeah the only ultimately of love, love. Ultima ultimately but you can't simply wish away this mind eh? i don't want i know this is not working i'm not going to think anymore let there be no thoughts it is so this is where we have the idea of concept of my eyes when the mind has come down then naturally there's a difference the difference is all the thoughts in there being mindless means lifting or being thoughtless means lifting this here at this level there's no difference mind becomes absolutely still you, you did give an uh, swamiji you did give an example of swami vivekananda how he uh, lifted his disciple he yes yes up. i was just going to tell that so that's a very good example maya is a statement of fact of what we experience depending at what level our mind is so the mind is something like the the tuning of a radio you know the old radio we bring the frequency down we pick one station we lift it then changes another station likewise the mind goes down over the locus of the mind location of the mind and when it is a very gross level then the five senses are functioning and body is acting when it goes to the next level then you become aware of the thoughts and ideas and emotions and feelings and all those in the mind space when it goes to another level and tune to that consciousness which is what is samadhi which is what we want to achieve then there's no difference and you are one with that reality that is what is to be experienced so once we understand that then we say no more of the mind going down that's where it gets caught turn it around and try to lift it up in the every step you take in that direction brings reduces the vrittis less and less and less and until a state comes where you are one with that higher being and that uh, that particular example of swami vivekananda's disciple manmathanath ganguly is a very wonderful practical demonstration when his mind was at the gross level he saw the river trees mountains and everyone then his guru lifted his mind and he just felt some vibration and thought in his brains and then it went to the highest level he said everything has been resolved into that ocean of consciousness and that experience that ocean of consciousness was an experience for him it was not some conceptual type of understanding intellectual or something and when the same mind came down this whole world reappeared so uh, so the maya is not like some illusion 
uh, or some magic or something. It is an it's a statement of fact. It's a direct experience of what we experience depending at what level our mind is. And that's a bit confusing because Maya is made up of the mind and the senses. Mind is a product of Maya. Senses are product of Maya. Relativity. Okay. Yeah. So you, you, so it's not. That's about why they say we are all in Maya. No, we say that way. Yeah, yeah, but it's not about lifting the mind. It's about quite. It's about not having the mind involved. Yeah, lifting the mind, not having the same thing. You're trying to reduce the difference. Okay. Mm. The mm. upper part is your reference point. You pulled a string down. Okay, a spring is tied to the top, which is the supreme consciousness, the universal consciousness. And we, we are, the ego is like at the lower end. And you pull it down and it's under stress. You pull it down and it's held together by all these attachments to the world and I and mine, my house, my honey, my family, my body, my whatever, my, my, my. All these things are actually the sources of all of our bondage. And when that's why renunciation is a method to release. So we detach ourselves mentally at least, then the spring will automatically rebound to its original position. So as it goes up, the tension and stress becomes less and less. And when it's totally freed, there's no stress in there. It's in perfect peace. So it becomes part of the ocean. You're then, no longer a wave. Yes, huh? yes, yes. But but those it, are just words, you know. Of course, that doesn't mean that, doesn't mean that I don't tell this word and you become enlightened. That's what I'm trying to get across. No, no I'm not saying that. I hmm. mean that um, it, it, it's words in the sense that it actually acts as a deterrence from actually where the conversation has to be, which is yeah. that it's Art? It has it has its utility that it tells you how to achieve that. It doesn't say this is the knowledge. Get me and you become enlightened. No, it says we with the so it's a double edged sword. Okay, it can yeah. bind you right. when it's directed inwards, yeah. but there's yeah. an intelligence behind it, and you can use it, and it says it can free you also. It's a screwdriver. You turn it clockwise, it'll tighten. Anti clockwise, it's not a fault. It's how you use it. And that comes from that buddhi, the intelligence which says, don't go this way, pravritti. You'll get bound there. Go nivritti. This is how the release is. So that understanding is also in the mind space. But yeah. the important thing is, yes, we are studying all the scriptures, all these through studies, concepts using the mind. You're getting a little enlightened, but it's not like a spiritual realization, but it's better than being totally ignorance. Yeah, but after this, we have to get rid of the mind, right? Huh? After this, we have to forget all this. Not forget that you have to transcend that, you see. Otherwise, if somebody hits you on the head and you suddenly forget, is that become, do you become enlightened? No. <laughs> okay, you forget a dementia, a guy forgetting he's got 100% dementia, does he become enlightened? No. no, because that's to do with memory. That's not to do with the mind. Yeah, well, in his mind, it's a memory, if suppose. So it's not like an artificial type of way of silencing the mind. You have to understand. Yeah. The vritti happens when the mind is raised to that high level where it's in perfect resonance. That is the type of mindlessness we want. Yeah. Not, you know, mechanically forcing it somehow type of thing. Okay. I think we understand that. So up to here, it has been good so far, I suppose. Yep. We got a few minutes more. Any more questions, discussions before we'll uh, go to the next? Uh... It's good to revise this and thresh it out and think rather than just to rush through and try to complete the, and the, the chapter or the verses for the sake of completing. I was thinking, Swamiji, just one thing, a little confused, is when you go up, like you become a ocean, you become a part of the ocean, you don't need the mind, do you? No, 
Yeah. That's why God God doesn't yeah. have any mind. Yeah, yeah, it ceases to exist. So you yeah. are one with the ocean, yeah. Because it's totally yeah. added. Mind is necessary to understand something that's outside you, all right? Yeah. Different. Right. But if I'm the ocean and all the waves are inside me, I know everything through a direct personal contact. Why do I have to go around and know? See, there's nothing existing outside me. So there's no mind from if you want to understand it from his perspective or God's perspective or our own higher perspective. So in that position, there is no mind, nothing else. You just yeah, that's why God has no brains. Yeah. He doesn't think, yeah. <laughs> you know. But he feels. That's the thing. Feeling. It's all about feeling. Yes. Ultimately. And that's so. Why, that's why bhakti is given so much importance because that's where the resonance comes. So the science of mantras is really about building that resonance. So Swamiji, God probably then only has the heart, isn't it? Because creation and all that happens with creation, all the complex things and we are created. How can someone without mind and without, without anything just sort of do something so awesome of course I'm not i'm not saying that mind is required i'm just saying that something definitely higher higher and higher than mind is it yeah imagine the being that has created this whole universe in which there are so many uh, galaxies solar systems and on that this one in one of those billions of solar system is this our solar system on this one planet and in that there are so many forms of plants, animals, this and that, and we are one of them. And what a magical creation he has made, see? And he's hidden himself in there as consciousness and projected a body, a mind complex, and all the drama of life and value, everything is going on. And yet he is totally watchful and detached, at the same time totally involved. Imagine the power of that being who can do all this, this and that is but you see would... you're calling it a so, being is, yeah. is it a being it's not a being you can these are because... so many so many words there that hint you that doesn't mean it is it it is just a indicator yes. of something mm -hmm. anyway that is what we are that's where we have come from that is the glory of who we are really mm. spiritually how wonderful isn't it So a man had a lot of questions like this, you know, why did you create, why is there so much misery, why are there so many wars, disease, suffering in society everywhere, who has created this, he could have done a better job, all these things, you know, and he said, if I met God, I will have all these questions to ask first, before I talk about anything else. So the story is that he went and, and, and said, anyone else got any questions? So everyone told the questions. I'm going to meet God and, and really have a, you know, give him my peace of mind, as they say. So he went there, entered, and after some time he came out. And everyone is asking, so, so what was it like? What, do you, what did he say? Did you ask the question? And he was so quiet. And after some, some time, he said, when I went there, I didn't find any God. I found myself sitting there. <laughs> There's no God as an external being. It is our own higher self. The bird. Bird on the top of the tree. So nice. Then he plays. So he then forgets himself and takes all these various roles and becomes, you know, I think it. Uh, and, and the movie goes on and he wakes up and says, okay, so well, let me dream another one tomorrow. And this world is like that. Anyway, it's not a terrible thing. He's just having some fun. And if you don't like the fun, you complain to him and he might say, okay, enough of that nonsense. That's why it's called Leela. You, because we can't rationalize it, that's why it's called divine play. Leela, Maya, all the girls' names. Yeah, all these different uh, words to just to say that it's incomprehensible. Yeah, mm. like Krishna says, I don't have a 
shape, no uh, name, no beginning, no end. Yeah. But, mm. but you see, now and then he can give you that full knowledge and then again send you back. How, how nice would that be? Okay. So he says, he's the director of the movie. And, and he says, hey, come, come sit me and sit with me here. And I'll tell you how the whole script is written. And I'll give you all the power. But now you go back and do the playing. But you are fully aware of the whole thing as a movie. And there are these special classes of beings who are there. They are called the Ishwar Kotis, who come to this world, not because they're forced to come here to modern Maya. They fully retain the knowledge of who they are. They are the Avataras and uh, the rivers. Yeah. Yeah, Avataras okay. and those his companions who come for some spiritual mm -hmm. ministration work. Mm -hmm. It's not possible, you know, and so they're always aware of their spirituality. So Sri Krishna, for example, you know, he's aware of his incarnation. Who he reveals himself to Arjuna. Hey, this is me. Look at this. It's not that he's not aware of it. But Arjuna is a jiva. He's an ignorant being. So for him, this knowledge is given and through him to us. Swamiji, in chapter two, uh, chapter three, probably in the karma yoga section, I, I had a conflict with what you just said. So uh, Krishna says that a perfectly realized being doesn't need to work and he can just be himself because he doesn't need to engage with the whole world. So he has no sensory attraction. He can just be himself and uh, can probably just be like that. But then again, in the same chapter, it says that a perfectly perfectly realized person has still got to work to make the world better. Not for himself, but for the world. So better this is means not fixing. He's like a you know, actor who is, who is now knowing the whole plot and he comes and plays the play, basically. Yeah. yeah. You will feel the urge to help others, not so like Swami Brahmananji would say, when his mind is at a pretty high level, he will see everyone in front of him are divine forms. And he says, they are all gods. What need I have to, you know, help them? They, they are all divine beings already. But when his mind would come down, then he says, oh, they in spiritually at that level, they are divine beings, but they are not aware of their divinity because they are in ignorance. And then he says, my God, they don't know. They are such wonderful beings. And they, yet they are suffering so much in ignorance. And then he makes that attempt to, you know, guide them and show them the means to, the, through spiritual knowledge. That is where that compassion sort of comes. You see, he doesn't, he doesn't say that they don't know. He says it's such a tragedy that within there's so much knowledge and outside so much ignorance. Within there's so much bliss and outside so much misery. And then, but they understand that they are not aware of it. That's why it's called spiritual ignorance. It is there, but they're not knowing it. And so the effort is then made to show to them or guide them how to have that experience or realize the, the true nature. So it's something like that. So does dharma and karma come in there? The dharma, the karma of the person or the dharma of the person? Not for that. Not, not for that uh, realized soul. He's not bound by dharma and karma. Uh, but he does it. He does it but without any attachment. While people do it in ignorance where they have a sense, I am the doer, I am the enjoyer, and this comes to me. While they do it and they say, I am only an instrument in the hands of the divine, which is what Sri Krishna is trying to tell Arjuna. This is a secret. Two things, but don't have the doership. Just be the instrument because I reside in your heart and I am pulling the strings. So operate in this way. That is turning the screw in the opposite direction. Thank you, Sanjay. Yeah. All right. Very good. Reflect on it. Think about it and see how you can apply it. See, all this is very good for the one hour we are trying to churn all this intellectual gymnastics. The real test is when you are working, cooking, office work, dealing with people and all that, how much of this comes in there? At least we try to make a conscious effort. And every moment you get one of them, you feel so good. Oh, at least now this knowledge is being so useful. It's all about abhyasa, practice.
ओमसोमा सदगमय तमसोमा ज्योतिर्गमय मृत्योर्मा अमृत गमय ओम शांति 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 हरिओं तत्सत श्रीरामकृष्णापनमस्ते